I've often thought if you if you read um, if you read the Old Testament, um, there's two things that stand out to me. That when a big thing happens, they memorialize it, right? Um, you know, um, they'll they'll build a, a mound of rocks, right? They memorialize these things that God has done, and I think baptism stands in that position in many ways for us today. That it is a touchstone for us to look back at what God has done, even as it is um, picturesque of what of what God has done in our lives. And I think that's awesome. Interestingly, um, Chad's talking about Israel. We'll get into that. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to throw the gauntlet right now to you. Okay? So here we go. The gauntlet is being thrown. Those of you who don't know what a gauntlet is, it was the glove that you wore on your sword hand. Right? <laughs> so I'm throwing the gauntlet out to you. Um, Israel today, the modern nation of Israel, is not the Israel of Scripture. So I'm just going to throw that gauntlet out there. The political, national country that is Israel is not the Israel of Scripture. It is a group of Jewish people who control that land today. The, the whole idea of blessing, you know, you see this on Fox News all the time. If you're a Fox News watcher, you see the commercials. You know, well, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Send us money now. <laughs> That's not the Israel of the Bible. And, and so, like you may support Israel. By the way, I do. I support the, Nash, the, the nation of Israel in a lot of the things they do. I do not support them in all that they do. Um, I support them for geopolitical, um, foreign, pol foreign policy reasons. Um, not because they are somehow, quote-unquote, God's chosen people. In fact, most of Israel is secular today. The overwhelming majority is secular. I, in fact, um, I would have to look, but I would bet that the nation of Israel today is more secular, at least statistically, than the nation of, of the United States. Statistically. So that's the gauntlet I'm going to toss out, and I think you're going to hear that over the next couple of weeks about the nation of Israel. You'll certainly hear it when we get to it in Romans. This blind support that they've been able to prey upon, right? Because we don't know our Bibles today anymore. And so they throw a verse up. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And you have Americans who go, oh my gosh, well, I don't want to get cursed. Here's your blank check, Israel. Okay? And I'm just telling you now, that is not a biblical principle whatsoever at all. And we'll get into it later. We don't have time to get into it today, so I probably shouldn't have thrown the gauntlet today. But I'm just telling you now that um, the modern nation of Israel is not the biblical nation of Israel. Okay? Furthermore, um, it's okay to support them. I support all kinds of countries that aren't Israel. I support England. Longtime ally. At least since about 1814, right? Um, so there's all kinds of countries we support. But, uh, and as a sometimes friend, by the way, when you get into foreign policy history, like, uh, which is what I used to do, you can find lots of examples where Israel was not America's friend as well. Just FYI. Like when they knew little of things were happening and they didn't tell us because they didn't want to burn their sources, so they let terrorist attacks occur against the United States because they didn't want to burn their sources. I mean, we should be cautious. But anyway, I digress. Let's go to Romans 8. Did you have something to jump? No? Nope. Okay. Let's get to Romans 8. We'll have fun with that when we get to 9. All right. So again, from whence we came. So I would remind you that, that Romans is Paul's magnum opus gospel message. He starts in chapter 1. Um, he tells us in verses 16 and 17 his mission. Right? Paul says in verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And I think those words alone we could spend weeks on probably. 
and of course, as you know, I would. But um, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the gospel? That's a really important question for you to ask. There are a lot of churches today that are ashamed of the gospel. My wife went to a church, or, or she grew up for a few years in this church. Her family went to this church in Southern California. They literally stopped using the Bible in their Sunday worship service. That would be offensive to people. That sounds to me like people who are ashamed of the gospel. Um, when, when it came for uh, time for their Easter worship <coughs> service, they didn't mention the Lord Jesus Christ at all. Why? That might offend people. So instead on Easter, they talked about how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and you too can be raised from the dead. Right? So, ashamed of the gospel. There are a lot of folks out there ashamed of the gospel. Paul says, I am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And we've talked about this. We'll hit it a couple of times in this lesson. But can you imagine? And you'll remember we talked about Paul's audience in Rome is very likely a mixed audience. Um, there are times where he's clearly talking to Jewish people. Right? I mean, when he's talking about the law and he's talking about circumcision, he's clearly talking to a Jewish community. But he's also talking to a Gentile community. But a Gentile community who would have been saved probably through the synagogues, which is a little mind-bending, right? But can you imagine to the Jewish audience what that last phrase, the righteous shall live by faith? I mean, Paul starts by throwing a massive blow to what Jews believed in the first century AD, right? The righteous shall live not by works, but by what? Faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not ashamed of that gospel message. And then after that, Paul dives into the sinfulness of mankind. Again, when we talk about being ashamed of the gospel, this is something that gets dropped a lot. We talk a lot about how much God loves you, but we also spend very little time talking about the holiness of God, the depravity of man, uh, the extreme separation between us, right? Infinite, from east to west separation because of our sinfulness and God's holiness. And Paul sets that up right out the gate. Paul's whole argument from chapter 1 to chapter 4 is you need a Savior. So let's look at Romans 1, chapter, or chapter 1, verse 18 to 23. This is Paul setting up his argument. Did I keep this in your notes? No. Chapter 1, verse 18. I think you have to maybe turn to it. Mm -hmm. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So you are without excuse so that I am without excuse. He's not ashamed of this gospel. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They set up idols. 
See, today we may not worship little, you know, little carved idols. We just worship the ones that our hearts spin out. Right? Charles Spurgeon said that about the heart, that it is the, the factory of idols. Just turns them out. Constantly churning out idols for us to chase after. John put it this way, right? The lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. We spin out idols like crazy that are constantly having to be crushed. We as believers still do that. We make ourselves idols. I would argue that the idol today is a flat piece of reflective material that we look at in the morning. We make ourselves idols today. Romans 1.24, so then Paul says three different God gave them overs. And he starts with that in verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. And then in verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. By the way, if you're looking for this to be a... Uh, we're going to go get after the, you know, the homosexual. That's not my, my intent here at all. That's an example that Paul gives. It is an example of dishonorable passions that God gave people over to. But you and I both know there are plenty of dishonorable passions that we chase after. So, verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. You may remember we talked about this passage, and I told you I've kind of gone back and forth over this. Uh, that somebody I really respect sees this as prophetic in a national way. Like America departed from Christianity, and so God gave them over. And so we look at America today, and we go, yep, it's pretty clear God gave America over. Well, Paul's not writing prophecy for America here. Right? But it would apply to Rome. And newsflash, it applied to Israel. Go back and read what Israel did. In fact, it applies to all mankind from the very beginning. Right? God said, this is what you want. Um, you heard Chad talk about uh, Babel this morning. Certainly we can look at the time of Noah, right? This is what you want? Okay. Have at it. Good luck. Wish you the best. Right? God gave them over. Okay, so that's chapter 1. And so you can imagine, right? The Jewish population is sitting there going, Preach, Brother Paul. Preach it to them. Tell these Gentile pagan Romans how evil they are. I mean, it didn't take far to look to Nero and to see Nero, who was on his fifth marriage, three of which uh, were homosexual, one of which was to a minor that he had castrated. And he wore the dress, I think, in that one. It was that one or the one before. By the way, again, when we get to Romans 13, buckle up. Buckle up, because the, the government that Paul says to submit to is that guy. And you may not think that the president can complete a sentence, but he ain't at that level of corruption. And yet, still, Paul says, submit. By the way, at the same time, what was Peter saying? Submit. Honor. Okay? So keep that in mind. But we'll get to that later. So the Jews are excited. Right? You can see it. Yeah. Tell those Gentiles, man. These Romans are bad people. <laughs> Go get them, Brother Paul. <clears throat> Pharisee Paul. And then here's what Paul says to them in chapter 2, verse 1. And this is distinctly written to the Jewish population. He tells them that they are accountable to God for sin. Verse 1. Right? Their presumption. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. 
Well, of course, the Jewish people were great at judging others, right? What did they use to judge them by? What was the measuring stick? It was the law. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. See, Israel is doing the same things. The, the Jewish population that lived in Rome, they're doing the same things. Go read the Old Testament and read how many times God says through uh, His prophets to the nation of Israel that they're not living up to the standard. Or that they, you know, you see this in, throughout Kings and Chronicles. This I have against you, says the Lord, that you have not torn down the temples in the high places. There's the obelisks in the high places. So, first he critiques their own presumption that because they are quote-unquote God's chosen people, they can do whatever they want. Paul says false. Uh, in verse 6, Paul says to the, his Jewish audience, he will render to each one according to his own works. Remember, the Jewish people believed, first of all, that if you were circumcised, this is rabbinical teaching from the first century A.D., that if you were circumcised, Abraham sat at the gate of ha gates of Hades and turned you around back towards paradise if you were circumcised. It's purely a works-based system in their mind. And Paul is confronting that. And he said, oh, okay. You want to be judged according to your works? Let's do that. Good luck. Well, let's do that. Let's judge you according to your works. Anytime I hear people talking in, when we're talking about the gospel and they talk about how good a person they are, oh, okay, well, good luck. What's that one dark thought that you had? I know you've had one. What was it? Oh, well, that's a work, right? I mean, Jesus says throughout the Sermon on the Mount, like if, if you lust after a woman, you're guilty of committing adultery with her in your heart. Right? I mean, we understand this concept. Paul is targeting that to his Jewish population. He says in verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Okay. That's what you want? You want to be judged by the law? It's fine. But that's what's going to happen. By the way, you've read the law. Most of you, I'm sure all of you, have read the Mosaic Code that was handed down by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Good luck keeping it. Good luck. We don't even have to get to what Jesus says about the heart to know that you would struggle to keep the law. Amen? And so, Paul is very clear. Okay, well, you'll be judged by the law. So, first, Jews are accountable to God for their sin. Second, the covenant has limitations. Paul talks about that, the law and circumcision. And he asserts at the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, that God will be, remain faithful to his people. God will remain faithful to his people. And then he summarizes it. You'll remember when we went through this originally uh, that we talked about John MacArthur's presentation of this in his commentary, that he sets it up like a court case, right? He's, he's reading charges. And then you have kind of this final summary of the charges that we see in, in verse 9 of chapter 3. So Paul says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not, not at all. No, we're not better off as Jews. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. 
No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive the venom of asps. Word you have to be careful saying is <laughs> under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their, their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Wow. Just in case you thought you were good, read that. Right? Read that. Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. Do you get what Paul's saying? Shut your face. Stop it. Stop it. You're not good. You're not able to save yourself so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So, chapters 1 through 3, pretty dismal, pretty rough. Right, so as Paul presents the gospel, he starts with where we stand before God, apart from Christ. And then, Paul begins to preach the gospel of justification. Martin Luther says that this passage, verses 21 to 26, which I think I included in your notes, Martin Luther calls this the chief point. Did you ever take a magnifying glass and try and burn an ant? <laughs> you tell I'm a boy and we did that. We did that. Trying to start fires with it. Raise your hand. I'm going to see. I know you did. <laughs> Sorry, your mom's sitting there. I just grabbed a jab. But yeah, if you did that, you had to get just the right pinpoint, right? That pinpoint moment where it's laser like. Right here, this is the laser pinpoint portion of all of Scripture for Martin Luther. It is the very central place of the epistle, he says, and of the whole Bible. Here's what Paul says. Verse 21, chapter 3. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Like we all ought to be like yelling amen right now. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by what? Faith. To be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. See, not yours. Not yours. This is to show God's righteousness. Paul just left your righteousness in complete tatters. Right? <coughs> if you're coming to this thing thinking you're bringing anything to it, you are sorely mistaken. And here's the thing. See, we're, I mean, listen, this is shared in Wyoming. You're pretty good people. Right, I mean, we're not supposed to Californians. <laughs> right? They're from California. They're, they'll be here soon, thankfully. So, um, but, but you know what I mean? Like, we feel pretty good about ourselves. Some of us were not out there murdering people and doing drugs, I say some of us, because we don't need to go into that for, for Brian. But, you know, I mean, the reality is, the reality is we probably think we're pretty cool. And we don't recognize that our hearts are every bit the train wreck before Jesus Christ. Every bit the train wreck 
is the worst of the worst. Every bit. They have just acted on sometimes what we've thought about. Don't even get go there, right? Paul has torn our righteousness asunder. See, this is for God's righteousness. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He has passed over for former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. And then we talked a lot about this word uh, justification. It's a really super important word. I'm telling you now, I, I am convinced that it is. I don't, I don't think you're saved by the doctrine of justification, by your knowledge of the doctrine of justification. Let me be very clear. If you don't know what the word means, can you still be saved? I love Alistair Begg talking about the thief on the cross, right? And, and uh, you know, do you, do you have the authority of Scripture now? Can you explain the doctrine of justification? Then what are you doing here in heaven, right? Like, we, we may not be able to, um, to define justification very well, and we're still saved. But I will tell you that as believers, we better be being discipled and sanctified to the point where we understand the doctrine of justification. Because it is through that doctrine that we are saved by God. You can't save you. You go back and read Romans 1 and tell me how you can save you. You go read Ephesians 2 and tell me how you can save you. The word justify, that word is a courtroom word. It has to do with a verdict that is rendered by God. Not by you. The righteousness of God. So the Greek word, I'm not even going to try and say it, but I can say they out. It's, yeah, I'm sorry. I can try, but now I want to. Anyway. Righteousness is conformity to a certain set of expectations. It is fulfillment of the expectations in any relationship. The righteousness of God is God's perfect fulfillment of both His nature, His attributes, and His promises. Of all three of those. <coughs> it is the same word when we say that God is just. God is righteous. He is upright. He is holy. And it is the same word that is used to justify. And you can see the similarities there. To justify is to declare right. It is, again, a courtroom declaration. That's why MacArthur, I think, hits this passage right on the head when he says there are these charges that are being levied against you. Right? And now God makes his declaration. Those who believe will be saved, will be justified. Those who have faith. And by the way, when we read what Paul says in Ephesians, those who have faith have faith that what? Saves that has been given to them by God. That not of yourself, that no man shall boast. To declare right, to put right, to cause one to be right, to be in a right relationship. The idea of justification is the declaration by God that the believing sinner is made right before God because the demands of the law are fulfilled through the righteousness of Christ. <coughs> Christ did. A person is righteous if they perfectly meet if they perfectly meet God's holy standard of righteousness. And instead of placing you and your righteousness on that scale, instead Christ's righteousness is measured on your behalf. For those folks that are like, yeah, but it's just not fair. I don't want to save me. I don't want God to do it. <clears throat> okay. Best of luck with that. I, I'm thankful that God is the one who determines who goes on the scale. Not me, but Christ. 
We say that the believer is justified. We use that word, but really we could say that they are righteousified. You are made righteous in Christ. It is a declaration by God. Can you imagine in the courtroom? Imagine in the courtroom you have the, the, the prisoner, the accused, the argument has been made, and the person in the courtroom says to the judge, Judge, I have determined that I'm innocent. Declare it so. You understand that that's the Arminian picture of salvation. Judge, I have declared myself innocent. Declare yourself so. Declare it so. That's the Arminian picture of salvation. The idea that somehow we're able to make that assessment. We're able to do it. You can't do it. Try. Let me know how that works out for you. Let me know how it worked out for countless numbers of Jewish people before the law, apart from God choosing them. And you'll remember even the story of Abraham that Chad talked about this morning. God chose Abraham. You'll remember Paul, God, or Saul at the time, right? Again, remember Greek and Hebrew name. God didn't change his name. Well, now you're a Christian, so we'll call you Paul. <laughs> probably not at all what happened, right? He had a Greek name, and he had a Hebrew name, okay? So the Hebrew guy, Saul, is the Greek-named guy, Paul, right? So when he was saved by God, talk to me about how he could say, Nah, God, no thanks. I'm good. Thanks for showing yourself to me, but ah, have you seen how cool I am? I just got Stephen Stone. I'm pretty cool. Right? Like that, That's not the case at all. Paul's very clear about salvation. I'm becoming increasingly strident there. You can't go through Romans and not. I'm pretty convinced. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Jacobus Arminius just ignored Romans altogether. <laughs> So, anyway, it is a forensic, legal transaction that changes our standing, our judicial standing before God because we believe. Christ's perfect righteousness is credited to the believer's account. And I just want to, you know, you may remember I spent a whole, whole Sunday on but nows. Um, but now but now God right so I included these three did I keep the verses there for you or no verse 21 but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all who believe in Jesus Christ for all who believe and then chapter 6 verse 22 but now but now, now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. But now, Romans chapter 7, verse 6, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Ephesians 2, verse 5, is it? But God. So we see this language in Paul over and over and over. This is where you were, but now. But God. And then, of course, in chapter, um, the end of chapter 3 through verse um, 25 of chapter 4, uh, we have... Paul's articulation of the great um, doc, or the great doctrine that the Reformation uh, will call sola fide by faith alone. By faith alone. Um, he starts this Romans chapter 3, verse 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Apart from works of the law. You can be obedient, and you better be obedient as a believer. If you're being disobedient as a believer, ask yourself how you view your salvation. If you're being disobedient, and you are, and you will, 
Let's, let's all, right? So that's all of us. But ask yourself how you view your salvation if you are going to walk in a continual path of disobedience. So yes, we are all sinners. That's why we <coughs> confess our sin. But understand, understand we are called to obedience. Be holy as I am holy. So, by faith alone, I got to get home. All right, by faith alone. And so he goes into it then with Abraham. Chapter 4, verse 3. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. By the way, which happened? The choosing of the believing first. It's not like Abraham said, I believe in this guy named God. I, be I clearly believe in that. And then God said, oh gosh, I guess I better get going here. God chose Abraham. Then what? Abraham believed. God chose Abraham. Abraham believed. And it was counted to him as righteousness. By the way, a little secret. Who's Israel? Those who believe. Right? Bible draws a distinction between true Israel and everyone else. Whew. Romans chapter 4, verse 23 to 25, we read about uh, Abraham's faith and the faith of Christians. Paul says this, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And so then we get into this section, and I'm going to skip much of this because it's what we've been covering recently, but it is the hope, the assurance that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we've been talking about, right? Um, in fact, we've covered all of this on this next page in the last little bit, chapters 5 through 8. You'll remember that this is a bookend, right? Book ended at the beginning, chapter 5, verse 1, and then ends with chapter 8. This is a whole section on the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We are freed from sin, we are freed from the law, and nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. That is this passage that we are entering into now in chapter 8. And so, I'm going to give you for homework to read chapter 8. Oh, I know, and I'll be checking. <laughs> from Ireland. Okay. Um, by the way, I had all kinds of fun things I did to people who didn't do their homework. <laughs> so, just warning you now, you might have to sing a song in front of everyone. Uh, you might have to put your nose on the board. I literally would draw, especially when I had chalkboards, I would draw a little chalk dot and they had to put their nose on it and stand on it. Strangely, we can't do that today. Yeah. Our missionary speaker is going to be speaking both services on the night. So you're still going to have to keep Wait. I was told we had a speaker in here that day. You. Our <laughs> best <laughs> I'm actually in these rooms. I'm still on the I get back to the bed. <laughs> All right, well, it's going to be a busy week. Kevin will each be expecting a phone call from Ireland. Yep, well, <laughs> expect that. <laughs> Just keep expecting. Let's pray.